Hi guys, Mr. Ridgeway here. Today we're going to be finishing up the second half of World War II from 1944 to 1945. So let's get started. So here today we're going to be looking at explaining the decisions behind U.S. strategy, but now again in the second half of the war. And then later in the block, you'll be looking at the short and long-term legacies of World War II, and they're really, really important. So make sure you check that, act that activity out. It's a jigsaw. Anyhow, let's talk strategy, and so this is going to be our mini lesson for today, is going to be the subject of this video. Uh, let's get started. So, boy, again, it's a very similar question that we looked to last time, how do presidents and military leaders decide on an overall strategy in wartime? So, like, when they look at what's on the ground and presented in front of them, why do they make the decisions that they do, and what does that result in? So, uh, where we are in 1943, okay, is that actually kind of on the whole, a lot of things haven't changed um, from really 1940, 1942 to 1943. But really, it's kind of like in 1944 that things start to really dramatically shift. So in Europe, where, where are things now? Um, Germany still controls uh, pretty much almost all of Europe, although Russia is now starting to make a little bit of progress in terms of pushing the Germans back on the Eastern Front. Um, Italy is only in fifty per, uh, is only fifty percent in Allied hands, and again, as we talked about last time, the Italian front does not move a whole lot, and there's very little progress there. Um, Britain is being heavily bombed, although that's starting to kind of decrease, and now the Allies are starting to bomb Germany. And we talked about that as being one of like the three alternative fronts that the Allies had. Now, um, in Asia, things are not really looking uh, very good at all. And again, you may recall that's because of the uh, Atlantic Charter that Wilson and um, Wilson, uh, that Winston Churchill and FDR uh, agreed to, where they said they were going to focus on Germany first and then kind of play on the defensive against Japan. So really, in Asia, uh, Japan still controls most of the Pacific. Uh, it still has naval and air superiority. And really, in Western Asia, it's still really in charge of things. So so especially in the Asian theater, the Pacific theater, um, things are either not looking good or they really haven't changed since the start of the war. Um, now, that does start to shift. Um, so let's talk about how the Allies defeat Germany. Okay, And this is called Operation Overlord. Um, the Allies know that if you're going to defeat Germany and Hitler, you're going to have to do... Um, not just the act of defeating Germany's armies, but you're going to have to defeat their people too. Okay, and this like this idea um, is very similar to like in the U.S. Civil War, where the um, where the North realized that if you're going to beat the South, you have to go to the South, and you have like you can't like you know just beat the German armies and then call it good. Like you have to invade and then not only beat its armies, but beat its people too. Okay, and we call this um, not just uh, total war, but I mean, it's kind of the name we give to it, but total war is not only like the home front being mobilized, but the war front, but they're going to go full out. Okay, and that's what we kind of give the name to total war, is that you're going to make war on um, not only our armies, but their citizens too. Okay, so what the Allies then begin planning is a cross-channel invasion. Um, there's lots of deception that goes into this. Um, the Allies, in terms of like where um, the map of the invasion, where it's going to happen, um, they do lots of deceitful things like blowing up. Um, you can find pictures of these; it's pretty ridiculous. Um, like blowing up like air-filled um, tanks that looked like tanks that were in like a certain spot, so it looked like they were going to cross the channel right there. Um, they also dropped like on the day of the invasion tons of little pieces of metal um, into the air in like the wrong locations to kind of blind radar. There's lots of like really interesting things that they go and do. Like I think on a couple beaches they like take soil samples even though they have like no intention of ever invading there. And so kind of giving Hitler the, the wrong message as to where the invasion is going to happen. Okay, um, but it does happen at Normandy on June the 6th, 1944. Okay, and let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, Hitler assumed that the Allies were going to cl uh, cross the English Channel, okay, because again, here's Great Britain, here's France. Uh, they assumed that the Allies were going to cross the Channel at Calais, um, which is right here, because it's literally only 11 miles um, across uh, the Strait of Dover here. But actually, the Allies land at a place in France called Normandy, 
Okay, and there's um, five beaches. Uh, the U.S. basically lands at two of them. That's Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. And then there's also a whole bunch of other code names for beaches of other forces that invaded uh, Gold, Juno, and Sword for the British Canadians. Okay, um, now, uh, if we look at that here, again, the whole point is that you're taking tons and tons and tons of troops, and you're basically moving them in this massive invasion. Um, and it is a huge feat of military planning and execution. Um, basically, the whole point there is that they're trying to establish a beachhead and then push on towards Germany. Um, the fighting is really, really nasty on a lot of these invade, not all the invasion sites, but one in particular is Omaha Beach. And if you haven't seen like the first 10 or 15 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, I highly recommend you go and do so. Um, and I can put it a link in the description below to make sure uh, you can go and see that. It's pretty, pretty intense. Um, have been there myself and it's, uh, it's a really interesting and like you can kind of understand why, why it would be that way in terms of this like really nasty invasion. So what happens over time, okay, is that if we look here at this map of Europe, um, the Allies are pushing west uh, or well, east towards Germany um, and Hitler makes um, one basically last gamble to change the war. Um, this is kind of a battle I want you to know just because it's kind of interesting. Um, it's kind of a big deal at the time. It was called the Battle of the Bulge. And what Hitler does is he sends, as the Germans are retreating because they're being beaten, they're again, they're fighting a two-front war um, against the Russians in the east and then the Germans in the west. Um, as they're getting pushed on by both sides, Hitler decides that the best defense is a good offense. And he has this massive tank invasion that goes um, across France. Um, and it's actually even more tanks than he used to invade France the first time. It's a huge commitment of troops, and it catches the Allies completely by surprise because it's right about Christmas um, Christmas time. Um, there wasn't any kind of like air superiority that the Allies could have at the time because of the weather conditions, and it was in the freezing cold and they catch the allies completely off guard um, and it creates this gigantic bulge in the map and you can see that kind of in this yellow right here um, as the allies begin to resist they kind of try to like push the bulge back in um, now what's interesting is not only once this gets pushed back, it's kind of also what happens after, because eventually, yes, the Allies do um, push into Germany, as the Soviets are doing the same, but there's a decision made here, and that is that when the U.S. is pushing into Germany uh, from the West, okay, and the Soviets are pushing in from the East, uh, the United States lets the Soviet Union take Berlin. Um, they basically, like, stop their army um, from moving on and, and accidentally basically fighting the Soviet Union. Um, but there's a big deal uh, that will happen um, kind of between the Americans and the Soviets. And Eisenhower, the U.S. commander at the time, kind of lets them have it. Um, now, why this is a big deal is because Berlin is going to become an incredibly important and very controversial place in what will be called the Cold War. We're going to be talking about that here in a few weeks. Um, so, Let's be clear here. Um, the Soviet Union lost somewhere around 20 uh, million people in World War II. Uh, it had paid like a really, really large human debt um, to kind of take on Germany. And so, therefore, should the United States, um, this bottom question, should Russia have been allowed to take it? Um, which will make the Soviets super happy. But you have to understand, if you let the Soviet Union take Berlin, um, then Berlin's going to become a hotbed in the Cold War. And that, as you will soon find out, becomes a huge problem because that is actually what happens. Or do you think the U.S. should have taken Berlin? It'll really make the Soviets mad, but you might prevent some parts of the upcoming Cold War. I don't know. There's not really a good uh, answer to this question. So what do you think? Write it down in your notes. Okay, so now let's shift over to Japan. Okay, so we're kind of backtracking here a little bit, 1943. Um, we know that from a military standpoint, okay, and I'm going to kind of move my video here so you can see this, um, the Pacific Ocean is full of islands. Yes, it is. Um, but why this is a big deal uh, is because that means that the war in the Pacific theater is going to look very, very different from that in Europe. You're not going to have this like one single massive channel invasion you have to do. Um, they know it's going to be a naval war. They know it's going to involve lots of aircraft carriers, but how you're going to exactly march across the Pacific to get to Japan, which is in the blue right there, um, is kind of a big deal. Um, so 
What should the United States do? Should it invade every little island as it travels to Japan? Or should it do something different? And the United States comes up with a different strategy, and they call this island hopping. Okay, uh, So they decide it would be way too costly and take way too much time to invade every single island. So instead, they hop, they skip some islands along the way, and they invade. But then in other cases, they just leave some Japanese islands untouched. But what happens is, is because those islands are then cut off, um, they just become unsupplied and they're basically useless. Um, so the United States actually saves a lot of time, money, men, material, those kind of things from this. And there's kind of some funny stories about how some like Japanese vets like reemerge after the war, like five or 10 or even many years later. And they're like, did we win? Because they had just been left there and they never, never, ever found out. Um, but anyways, uh, so let's talk about a couple battles that really kind of prove this here. And also some larger lessons that you want to be aware of. Let's talk about Midway and Guadalcanal. Okay? Um, Midway is an island. Uh, it's a U.S. island all the way out in the Pacific. Um, I don't know if we still are in control of Midway, but I think we still do have a presence there. I'd have to look that up. Um, but Midway okay, um, is right here on this map. Okay, and there's a very, very famous battle that happens here. Um, it is the first naval battle where the opposing naval forces never actually even see each other. It's all done with plane to plane, well, plane to ship and plane to plane fighting. Um, now, it's a really good symbol of how naval warfare has changed. Now, it's aircraft carriers and not destroyers that are important. Um, but it's the outcome here that's kind of crucial. Um, the U.S. destroys four of the Japan's uh, carriers, which again, big deal because carriers are obviously the big power in World War II. Um, and many historians, maybe not all, uh, consider that Midway is kind of the turning point where the United States can prove that it can beat Japan, um, that also by keeping most of its aircraft carriers alive in this battle, um, that it can really kind of turn the tide. Okay. Uh, now, Guadalcanal is a really good um, example of of island hopping, okay? Uh, Guadalcanal is an island. It is down, right down here, okay? It is in the Solomon Island chain, I believe, okay, which is right there. Um, and Guadalcanal um, is a really good example of what happens like when the U.S. does island hopping. Now, it's one of the islands that the United States decides to pick, okay? Uh, but the fighting there, just like almost every, pretty much every other island in the Pacific, is extremely bloody. It is step-by-step -step progress um, because the Japanese code of war at the time and kind of their cultural ethic meant they literally fought to the death rather than, in most cases, um, rather than ever surrender. Um, and it signals that the conflict will be extremely, extremely bloody. Um, if you haven't seen um, some parts of Hacksaw Ridge, I'd recommend that. I can also put that in the uh, links to the scene, uh, links in the description below are some pretty good, I think, depictions of kind of what that might have been like. Uh, so, um, yeah, there's Guadalcanal. Uh, so, anyways, so as we can see here, okay, uh, this red line kind of represents how far Japan uh, progresses, and you can see here that the United States just kind of hops its way along um, until it gets close to Japan. Okay, uh, now, let's talk about the atomic bomb, because this is finally going to bring an end to pretty much all of World War II. Um, when the United States pushes on to Japan, like they've taken over almost every single island besides the Japanese mainland, there's a question that arises, and it's actually to President Truman, not President FDR. That is because FDR's dead. Um, he died of a massive, essentially, brain hemorrhage um, just a couple weeks beforehand, and President Truman, who takes over, now learns about this new uh, weapon that's been developed by the United States that's what scientists will tell him, uh, that is extremely, extremely destructive. Um, so Truman has a choice. Like, how do you want to end the war in Japan? Do you want to invade it just like you did all the other islands? Or are you going to drop this bomb and maybe that works? Uh, and Truman decides to drop the first atomic bomb uh, named uh, Fat Man on the city of Hiroshima. Uh, and the result is pretty devastating and is still being felt today. Um, this picture, I believe, is also the, um, an, uh, the other picture that, of Nagasaki, where the second atomic bomb was dropped. Um, because after the Japanese encounter the first atomic bomb, they're shocked, really. Um, they can't understand what happened or um, 
you know, they're just stunned, and it takes them about three or four days. Truman's waiting on a call for surrender, or Truman is waiting on a response from a call to, uh, to surrender, and the Japanese don't give one, so he drops a second one um, on um, the city of Nagasaki. It is probably... I could say maybe it would make a good top five list of the most controversial decisions ever made in world history. Um, and that's because uh, the atomic bomb like has some pretty devastating effects all the way up until um, today. Like people are still being affected um, either with birth defects or um, kind of like rates of cancer and other things like that by the atomic bombs in Japan. Um, and so Japan does actually surrender after the second atomic bomb um, is dropped on Nagasaki. And that will bring an end to the war. But what it all means, that's another question we'll have to look about a little bit later. Okay, so that's going to be the end of this mini lesson. I hope that was helpful in looking at the decisions made behind U.S. strategy during the ending years of our war. Um, and until next time, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.